Welcome to Brainwaves, a weekly forum where you can ask questions of leaders in the mental health field, scientists, scholars, advocates, and people with lived experience. <laughs> I'm Brandon Staglin, your host, and I started this webcast nine years ago. As a survivor of schizophrenia, I felt it was important for the public to understand the amazing potential inherent in the science that one mind scientists are conducting to develop better, safer treatments for individuals who struggle with brain health challenges. I also wanted the public, especially those who struggle with mental health challenges, to know the amazing potential inherent for recovery as modeled by those who have recovered in their stories. Thank you for joining us. Feel free to drop us your questions and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can during the Facebook premiere. We've been talking on Brainwaves about managing mental health during the coronavirus pandemic. And today's topic is neurodiversity. Those with serious mental health challenges, including but not limited to autism, schizophrenia, like I experienced, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, and a range of other conditions, often have talents, special skills, and unique abilities that allow them to flourish in often non-traditional and sometimes even counterintuitive ways, perhaps even in the physical isolation imposed by the pandemic. Joining us now are two amazing leaders in the neurodiversity movement and, and, and in their fields, respectively. We have um, John Elder Robeson. He's an author, educator, and neurodiversity advocate. He is the neurodiversity scholar in residence at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. And he's his, his two, 2007 memoir, Look Me in the Eye, My Life with Asperger's, details his life on the autism spectrum. And Dr. Temple Grandin is an author, spokesperson, autism rights activist, and a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. She was diagnosed with autism as a child. In 1986, her first book, Emergence, Labeled Autistic, was an unprecedented look at uh, the autism experience from the inside. And later, Matthew Racher and Carlos Larari are brain health advocates, and they both have lived experience with schizophrenia and they inspire audiences around the nation and the world using their, their band, Fog Dog, with their music. They have amazing musical talent. Uh, so they'll join us later for a special performance. So for, uh, first, John and Temple, thank you both so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your being on the webcast. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, we're so lucky to have you here. Um, I'll start with John. John, what do we mean when we talk about neurodiversity? Is it controversial at all? And how do you, why, how did you come to focus your life's work on it? Um, well, first of all, I guess I would say that um, while neurodiversity is very important to me and it's regarded as, for me, it's one of the, people say it's one of the most important things I do. Um, I actually have a job. I run a company that restores automobiles. And, um, and, and so to say it's the main thing I do sort of dismisses uh, what I've done for 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it would not be possible for me to be here as a neurodiversity advocate if I didn't have the foundation of a successful business that makes that possible for me. Um, as, as for neurodiversity, neurodiversity is a different way of looking at cognitive uh, differences. Um, we recognize that uh, some, some things happen to us through life experience that change how we think and see the world and how we behave. Um, other differences that set us apart from other people are part of us from birth or very early childhood. And, and I think that it is significant and empowering to recognize that um, being born different from other people doesn't make you less than other people. It doesn't make you a second rate person. So neurodiversity is recognizing that diversity in human cognitive function is a natural thing. It's not that there are healthy humans and broken humans. Mm -hmm. There's no question that, you know, we suffer sometimes from aspects of being different. We suffer from anxiety and depression, for example, but we also benefit from exceptionality. So the idea of neurodiversity is recognizing 
the mix of disability and exceptionality. Mm -hmm. And of course, not everyone feels that way. Some people say, well, I am totally disabled. I don't see any exceptionality at all. And, and that's why I think there's a very wide range of, of opinion about whether people think that paradigm applies to them or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful thought and a powerful idea. Uh, all, I believe all of us have strengths that we, are unique to us and, and enable us to succeed in ways that others can't. Uh, can you please describe some of the ways that people with mental health challenges might actually do better under certain circumstances than those who you might call neurotypical? Well, um, autistic people, for example, tend to be um, weak at reading emotional cues from other people. So when we don't sense your smile or your body language and we misread your intentions, um, another person might see that as a deficit in us, as an obvious disability. But for many of us, that is offset by a superior logical reasoning ability. So sure, you might see that we can't tell if you're smiling or frowning and how you feel, but we can solve logical puzzles and we can use that reasoning in ways that often typical people can't. We have other abilities that are associated with autism, our attention to detail, our exceptional focus, oftentimes our photographic and prodigious memory. Those are all things that can make us exceptional, but there are trade-offs and, and people often focus on the disability and I feel that we need mm -hmm. to look at both sides. I love that. That's fascinating. Thank you. Temple, you've written, I'm different, not less. And this is at the heart of the autism, excuse me, the neurodiversity movement as, as we know, know of it. How does being on the autism spectrum help you connect in a special or unique way with animals? And how does it help you in other aspects of your life? First of all, I want to say that I thought John did a beautiful job of framing some of these issues, just a beautiful job. Um, I'm an extreme visual thinker. And when I was young, I didn't know that other people didn't think the way I did. So my very first work with cattle, I looked at what cattle were seeing when they went through the shoots. And other people thought that was kind of weird, but I thought everybody thought in pictures. Now, since then, I've had my TED talk that I did, The World Needs All Kinds of Minds, where I talk about the visual thinkers who think in photorealistic pictures like me, the math thinkers, the pattern thinkers, and the word thinkers. And there's actually scientific evidence for this, and it's called object visualizer, that's me, or visual spatial, that's the mathematical mind. And we need the different kinds of minds. I've worked with designing equipment in the, uh, in the cattle industry. And in working with these very large uh, uh, factories, I've, I've worked with every single major meat company. There's a very interesting way that the people who build and design factories is split up when you look at it in terms of the different kinds of minds. The visual thinkers like me do the skilled trades, what I call the clever engineering department, a super mm. clever packaging machine, for example. And then the more mathematical engineers do boilers and refrigeration. I've seen that pattern in every, <laughs> every, every plant. And I'm gonna guess that about 20% the skilled trades I work with, welders, millwrights, designers, would either be autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. <laughs> and they were the kid that was terrible in school, who was saved by the shop teacher. And one uh -huh. of the worst things that's been done in the schools is taking out all the hands-on classes. Mm. That gigantic shortage of skilled trades, we need our visual thinkers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, it's been an interesting journey for me. Uh, and I wrote about visual thinking in one of my books, Thinking in Pictures. And when I wrote that, I didn't know about some of the other kinds of thinking. Now, in the updated version, I address that because I just assumed everybody thought the way I did. And I, I totally agree with what John has to say about, you know, certain abilities. Yes, I have the same social issues, but I'm a problem solver. Right now, I've been looking up <laughs> everything on drugs for COVID. I have looked up because uh, I'm in the at-risk population. And, oh, yeah. by do, and that turns off some of the fear. By, uh, the, it turns on the exploration, the curiosity. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, knowledge is power. I, I love to research things too. Um, you, you talk about different types of thinking and uh, I find like when I, when I was in college, I, I was an engineering major and uh, I like to uh, design, I designed, took a class where I designed robots with a, a partner and uh, I did more of the like creative, like visual 
um, design work, whereas my partner did more of the analytical and, and mathematical work. So we each have But you strength. need both kinds of minds. Let's take the iPhone, yeah. for example. Yeah. Steve Jobs was an artist. Uh -huh. the more ma that's why your phone's easy to use. The uh -huh. more mathematical engineer had to figure out how to make the phone work. So when you swipe it, when you do this, it uh -huh. would actually swipe. You see, that's an example yeah. of needing both of the minds. You Absolutely. You need the different kinds of minds to solve problems. It takes a village. Okay. Uh, thank you, Temple. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, John, what about all the other professions out there, uh, as, as Temple's been talking about? How can companies benefit from more neurodiversity in the workplace? And how can companies become more welcoming and inclusive of people who think differently in different ways? Um, about uh, 10 years ago, a software company, SAP, started an initiative called uh, Autism at Work because they, uh, some of the managers there saw uh, autistic kids that had really exceptional skill using computers, even at an early age. And they thought um, autistic people might be good at software problem solvers. And that proved to be true, but it, they also discovered that um, autistic people had abilities in many other areas. They could work in finance and planning and, and, and so on. And so um, they created an initiative called Autism at Work, where the stated goal was not to accommodate disabilities, but to gain competitive advantage mm -hmm. by using people who are different. And in the last three or four years, um, Autism at Work has spread. They've shared the ideas and they've been picked up by such diverse companies as Ernst & Young, Ford Motor Company, um, Microsoft, uh, Google, Home wow. Depot, um, Rite Aid, ph pharmacies, or, you know, stores, all kinds of companies are, are following the Autism at Work model. And they are all recognizing huh. that if they decide to welcome autistic minds because they're different, what about folks who are different in other ways? People who are dyslexic, for example, maybe maybe reading uh, backwards is is a disability if you're trying to read a printed book in a classroom, but if you're reading other things in the conduct of your life, it's not necessarily a disability at all. So that's again, a possible advantage. Um, people with um, other neurological differences are now being welcomed into this larger universe of neurodiversity at work. And, and many, many companies are doing that. You're also seeing um, hundreds of colleges starting neurodiversity on campus programs, both with neurodiversity support for students, but also at uh, schools like William and Mary, where they are teaching neurodiversity as a culture, as a civil rights initiative, and also from the perspective of biology and evolution. Um, you mentioned in the introduction that I'm the neurodiversity scholar at William and Mary, and we were at, the, at William and Mary, we were the first com first university to teach that. I'm also the neurodiversity advisor for Landmark College, which is the only college in America that was actually established by neurodivergent people to teach our own population. Wow. So the staff at Landmark consists of many people with autism, ADHD, dyslexia, a schizophrenia, anxiety, huh. and, and it is us teaching people like us, which is fundamentally wow. different from the model in special ed and public school where you have non-autistic teachers telling autistic children how to act. And that's okay. a thing that meets with a lot of resistance and doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, what we're seeing evolve right now. That's amazing. Peers teaching peers. I mean, that's 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 a what a great model that's that is because people can relate better that way with each other. Well, I, absolutely. If you live it, you know, yeah. it's not it's not like I'm telling you how to act. This is this is what I did in my life. And if you're like mm -hmm. me, yeah. this could be relevant to you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. I love that. Uh, and you're what you're talking about SAP and it's, it's uh, autism. In the, at the workplace program, autism the work program. Um, yep. One Mind has an initiative called the One Mind at Work uh, program, and we'd love to connect with you offline to learn more about that and see how we can integrate um, that into our work to integrate people with mental health challenges into the workplace. So we'd love to follow yep. you afterward. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Um, so, uh, Temple, how receptive do you find audiences to be to the idea of neurodiversity? And how do you persuade people about the abilities of those with mental health challenges? Well, let's talk about, I talk a lot about the different kinds of minds. The photorealistic visual thinker, object visualizer, the math pattern, a visual spatial, and the word thinker. And people ask me about this. I said, the first thing you have to realize is that different kinds of thought exist. Um, I've, it's been shocking for some highly verbal thinkers to find out that visual thinking um, exists. And there's a few people that have ant fantasia. They're rare, but they have no visual thinking at all. I actually found scientific papers on this. Wow. And I've talked to quite a lot of <laughs> college deans, even some college presidents. And I'm concerned that some of their strict requirements, like you got to have algebra. I couldn't do algebra. But you need us visual thinkers to solve problems. Um, I've talked about that in my talks, angle of fragile angle of attack sensor on a Boeing airplane, and they trusted just one of those. Uh, Fukushima flooding because they didn't put in watertight doors. Uh, these were visual thinking mistakes. Mm. Now, I can't design a nuclear reactor, but you still need the visual thinkers. We need all the different minds. And I've had some uh, deans and stuff kind of get a light bulb moment. Also, getting into dyslexia. I found a wonderful article years ago, and I think it's a book, about dyslexic CEOs. Because some people that are dyslexic, they've got great vision. And in my talks, I always ask, what would happen to Thomas Edison today? Hyperactive high school dropout. <laughs> well, and Michelangelo was a sixth grade dropout. Mm, it's mm, very, very mm. well documented. Okay. Very well documented. Einstein, no speech until age three. What would happen to those people today? I'm not going to put labels on them, but they were not a conventional educational path. We wow. need the different kinds of minds. And I really, really emphasize that. And people that are different have uneven skills. Trying to make me an algebra specialist, that's sort of a waste of time. It's better off to um, have me do things where I can use my skills, design equipment, animal behavior. There's people that are visual thinkers that are gifted in art. And I've been out to Silicon Valley. Half those programmers are on the autism spectrum. I've been there. <laughs> I've seen them. Wonderful. Um, I think Malcolm Gladwell uh, mentioned in his book, uh, David and Goliath, about how um, dyslexic CEOs had, had, many people with dyslexia had become CEOs because of the strengths that they had. Well, there's a vision like, okay, let's just look at it. We're kind of locked down right now. And I'm, I, even when this started, I said, I'm afraid whether we're going to, my things are going to be canceled this summer. That was a month ago. I was, you know, predicting that. And, and I, we might be doing <laughs> school online next fall. I don't know. I hope not. But okay. I could see that this was going to, the COVID mess was going to take longer to work out of it than, than other people were kind of seeing it. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, hopefully we can benefit from your vision and by looking farther ahead down the road and all planning for things that are that are going to come. Well, I'm looking at what do we have to have to totally get us mess. Okay, cheap drugs to treat COVID. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, things didn't go as well as we would have hoped on that. Yeah. Um, but that would be something that would enable you to us to get out of it quickly. A vaccine that's going to be a ways away. Yeah, we need those things. Uh, and this brings me to think about our next question, which is that we're living in trying times, obviously, with the current coronavirus pandemic, and this could last a while. Many people are mentally resistant to the idea of social distancing and probably wouldn't want to stay social dis socially distant for a long time. But might there be some people who actually thrive in being physically alone? Well, maybe for some people on the autism spectrum, it's going to be less of a problem. I'll tell you something that's helped me because I've, I've been on some other talks with families I got to get up in the morning, take a shower, get dressed for work by eight o'clock. I find that helps me to feel a whole lot better. And I try to get some writing done in the morning. I'm updating my Improving Animal Welfare Practical Approach book. I'm updating that right now. I've got another book, uh, another book coming out. To, um, but get up and do some writing, get some work done, you know, before I get tired. Awesome. You're such a dynamo. It's amazing to hear all that, you, all that you're doing, but even before eight o'clock. Um, John, uh, you've been doing some blog posts about the current COVID crisis. What are your thoughts on what people with challenging mental health issues are going through right now? I think that um, autistic people may be um, more vulnerable to uh, stress. Um, 
during the time of this pandemic. And actually, I think that part of this applies to anyone who's different. Because if you're a kid who um, was bullied in childhood because you were different, whether that's because you physically look different or you sound or act different, maybe you come from a foreign land or you you have a, a developmental disability like you didn't speak clearly as a child, um, those things all set you up for bullying and ridicule as a child and, and as adults, people who've grown up with that are hypersensitive to any kind of bad news or criticism. And we tend to internalize that as, as speaking to us because you're already told that you're no good. And, and so now we hear we're all going to, 4% of us are going to die. And we think, well, that means we are all going to die. Um, all of us second class people. And, um, and I think that's a very a dangerous, um, but very common mindset among people who have been uh, bullied and marginalized as children, which includes a great many neurodivergent people. And I think that that's a thing that we need to be mindful of. But at the same time, there are, again, aspects of gift as alongside disability. For example, a very emotional person might read a, a news story, such was in the Washington Post that says... Um, 10% of middle-aged patients who go into the hospital with coronavirus will die. And, um, and it's very easy for uh, an emotional person to think, oh, the sky's falling, that's the end of the world, I'm going to die, everyone I know is going to die, we're all middle-aged. And yet, a logical autistic person could read that, and they could say, why do they have it backwards? They, it would be more relevant to say 90% of people who enter the hospital in middle age with coronavirus will survive. Mm -hmm. uh, because indeed, that is the statement that applies to the vast majority. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, if you can apply logic in a time like this, it can confer benefits. But we are absolutely vulnerable, um, many of us, because of our childhood histories. I love that tip you just gave. It reminds me of a poem written by um, one of the members of our scientific advisory board, Sam Berendez. He's a psychiatrist at UCSF. Uh, it's about uh, written for kids, um, it, but it's about the red and the blue box. And when you make a mistake, you can put your experience into a red box and, and make it like get you down for the rest of your day and your week and so forth. Or you can put it in the blue box and make it something that you learn from and grow from. Um, so it's how we choose to interpret our experiences can really make a difference in whether it's constructive or destructive. Um, so I really, I really like what you just said. Thank you. Um, uh, so, and also what you said about the COVID crisis and people being logical about it, um, that's helpful for me to hear. Uh, I've been really Logic's concerned. Logic has helped with, me. I'm, Logic I'm, has helped me. Uh -huh. I, I don't know how many journal articles I've read about medications for COVID. It's gotten uh -huh. controversial, so I'm not going to name any drugs, but I have some ideas of how I could save myself. We'll leave it at that. They're still totally okay. experimental. Okay. Okay. Well, I hope you can stay healthy and don't need to try that. But well, uh, I don't. I'm. I'm. Uh, uh, since I'm totally at risk, fortunately, I've got some other people shopping for me. Okay. Okay. I'm glad you have that help. So we were talking today about neurodiversity with John Robeson, an author, educator, and neurodiversity advocate. He's also the neurodiversity scholar in residence at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and Temple Grandin, an author, spokesperson, and autism rights activist. She's also a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Temple, what are some of the biggest barriers to fully embracing the idea of neurodiversity? Do you find people Well, have? I started out in the cattle industry in the 70s, and the biggest barrier was being a woman. Definitely, absolutely <laughs> the biggest barrier. And, I, you know, John talked about the importance of his job, uh, restoring uh, cars. Well, I have a job. I've worked. I've designed equipment for every major meat company on cattle behavior, research and animal behavior. And I think it's very important that I have a real job. Autism is an important part of who I am, but it's secondary to the scientist. That That's the most important thing. Now, the thing I learned when you're different, and I learned this really early, was to simply show off my work. That was shown very nicely in the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, which showed... They actually had my original drawings in it. 
I would simply take the drawings, show them to people, show them pictures, show the work off, sell your work. I wanted to sell my work instead of myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we need, you know, as I, we have a huge shortage of skilled trades right now. There's skills we're losing. We don't make elevators anymore in this country. We don't make, okay, we got all these warehouses that bring us all the stuff that magically comes online. There's a whole lot of conveyors in there. They're from Europe. <laughs> that's because they didn't, they, they kept their skilled trades in the school. You know, don't stick your, your nose up at those things. Um, I worked with so many really smart people inventing all kinds of things. Wow. Um, they, uh, it's sometimes difficult for people to, to imagine that a mind is, is different. Um, there's been discussion in the scientific literature about <laughs> animal consciousness in serious scientific journals. But you know what I found? The word thinkers tend to deny animals consciousness. Mathematicians, <laughs> visual thinkers, they go, well, yes, of course, the dog's conscious. Oh, wow. So it's been interesting yeah. for me to try to figure out yeah. how um, thinking uh, verbally is, uh, is completely different. Now, here's a paper I want to throw out to everybody. It's a paper called Genomic Tradeoffs. Or autism okay. and schizophrenia, the steep price for a human brain. The same genes that make our brain big, brain development genes are involved with autism and schizophrenia. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you're not going to get rid of it. Yeah. And I read an article about how people with schizophrenia, our brains are uh, actually larger in the occipital lobe. You know, so there's actually some, some benefit in terms of brain capacity uh, to, to act and, and, and process uh, signals uh, that may be a benefit uh, to those. Well, you see, well, I think it's a continuous trait. A little bit of autism, it can be an advantage because uh, there's research now that's showing a brain can be more thinking or a brain can be more social emotional. It takes a lot of processor space to be social emotional. Yeah. So yeah. where do you allocate that processor space? It's towards all a trade -off. thinking and the logic or towards the social emotional. And there's a certain range. It's just normal variation. Uh -huh, when you slap uh -huh. a label on it, it's a true continuous trait. Well, I love that. Totally. Um, so this makes me think of the next question, John. Are there any limitations to the benefits of neurodiversity? Um, I don't know what a, benef a limitation to the benefit would be. I think the limitation of neurodiversity is is to an individual. Uh, I think somebody might say, well, I don't think this neurodiversity paradigm is really the best way to understand my, my child, for example, who is very disabled and does not speak or communicate uh, in the typical fashion. I think my child is mostly disabled. Um, there are other people though, who might have a, a child that you could describe the same way. And, and they would say, I love the idea of neurodiversity and it gives me a different framework to understand my child. And even with these disabilities, it gives me a context to put my child in the world. Um, for individuals like me or like Temple, you know, we obviously say, well, we embrace that idea or, or in some cases we say we reject the idea. But I, but I think the point is that it's up to each of us to decide if we think that that's a model that works either for us or for someone in our family or someone that we, we deal with. Okay. Uh, that, yeah. It's up to us to decide how we interpret our minds and our brains and those around us. Yeah. Um, to sum up, John and then Temple, what are some key takeaway points you'd like viewers to remember about neurodiversity and specialized thinking? We need to look at what a person can do. I love what Stephen Hawking uh, uh, said to the New York Times right before he died. He said, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. I just love that quote from Stephen Hawking. Mm -hmm. um, I go to a lot of autism meetings and I see all kinds of kids actually been grounded now since March 12th. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I see the junior, a kid looks like a junior programmer from Silicon Valley and the kid hasn't learned any life skills. The other big thing I'm seeing all the time now is grandparents that will come, come to me and they'll say, oh, I'm finding out I'm on the autism spectrum when the kids get diagnosed and grandpa, daddy's got a great job because he learned how to work at a young age. We got to do our academics, but we also need to learn how to work. Things like um, uh, volunteer work, okay, things like at a church. I know that's all shut down now. 
That's perfect for 11 and 12 year olds to do a task outside the family, get into a job before they graduate from high school. Um, it's, uh, they're letting the label run, run them. And I'm, mm. I'm seeing too many kids getting addicted to video games and they're not becoming video game designers or something, you know, useful. They're just in the basement and we've got to get people out doing things and, and doing things they can do. And mm. I've been to some of the companies that employ people on the autism spectrum. One of them, was, uh, they were checking web pages for problems and they just saved a company from going broke because a phone number was messed up on one of their uh. web pages. Uh -huh. but that's a detail that matters a whole lot. Totally, totally. That reminds me of when I was an engineering intern and I was working and found all these errors in the um, design of uh, aircraft engine parts um, and telling my boss about it. And he was grateful, but he said, no one's ever found these things before. So I felt I felt like I was doing something worthwhile. But they they don't see detail like I've I'm I get when it comes to cattle I go into a place and the cattle won't walk up to shoot and it's because the paper towels are hanging out of the rack and okay. then when I show that to somebody they go like this and the paper towels are just doing <laughs> just a little tiny little movement like this just like that uh -huh. Uh -huh. and but they don't see it you have that visual they mind you see those things see it. now when I yeah. point it out then it's obvious so I guess wow. that gives me job security, but um, <laughs> it's been an interesting journey for me, learning more and more about how the different minds are different and the skills they have and how those skills can complement each other. Totally, totally. I'm totally with you. And John, what are some key takeaway points that you'd like to viewers to remember about neurodiversity and specialized thinking? I agree that we need to focus on what we can do, because I think that dwelling on what we can do and on the ways that we're disabled, I think that it's just inherently unhealthy. Every person becomes disabled in a variety of ways, inevitably through the passage of time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the healthiest perspective is to focus on what you can do all of your days and, and to try and, and be the, the best you can be at that. I, I think that's a thing that we really lose sight of. Temple uh, spoke about the importance of uh, young programmers learning uh, social skills. And often we talk about how special ed programs need to teach kids with autism diagnoses social skills in school. And, and that's true. We do need to learn social skills, but I think it's a little unfair to say autistic kids need to learn that. The fact is, um, we have a generation of young people who have grown up texting and, um, and, and communicating uh, over smartphones. Um, I may have been born with a disability reading body language, but a kid who spends most of his or her time texting has acquired a disability in reading body language by not doing it in those formative years of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, when we started college in the United States, you know, back at the founding of our country, one of the things we colleges taught was deportment. And that was how to behave in different situations. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to return to teaching consciously the value of behavior in different situations. As Temple said, it's important for us to have work skills, but that's part of the larger idea of life skills and knowing how to put them in context, how to behave when you're at a guest's house, how to behave when you're at a job interview, how to behave when you're on a checkout line at a grocery store or when you're working in a cattle factory. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's not just important for neurodivergent people, it's important for everyone. We are, if anything, the canaries in the coal mine. We, we show the need for everyone to do it. Wonderfully, wonderfully said. Um, and I, I totally agree. And I'd love to be um, more proactive about uh, helping people understand the need for uh, getting along in, in the world. And the part of that is involves social skills. Um, so th thanks for those amazing words. So finally, Temple and John, what words of hope do you have for viewers and for those striving to dispel stigma and foster acceptance for those with mental health differences? Okay, well, for me, it's uh, basically uh, show people what you can, what you're capable of doing. 
I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, making portfolios of work, figuring out back doors to get into jobs. I mean, half of all good jobs, uh, you, you get into them because you know somebody. I just talked to a lady just the other day. She's got a really cool tech job. I've got to keep the confidentiality. In her 50s, super cool tech job, brilliant engineering mind. She was waiting on tables at a restaurant and talked to two engineers, and she was in. Talk wow. about a back door. That's a real person. Just talked to her in the within the last week. She's a go-getter. That's amazing. And she's got a really cool job. Okay. And, uh, and she they she just got talking to him. They could see she was really intelligent. And, that, and then they had to come to the workplace and they tried her out. Talk about a back door. Yeah. And the front door is not the only way to get into things. And there's a okay. scene in the HBO movie where I go up and I get the editor's card. That's an important scene. Because I'm mm -hmm. recognized if I started to write for that magazine. That would open uh -huh. up a lot of doors. Wow. Seeing the back door. That's wonderful. You see things that other people don't. That's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. John, what are some words of hope that you can offer for people struggling to dispel stigma and foster acceptance with mental, for people with mental health differences? I would urge people, whenever they encounter someone who behaves in a strange or unexpected way, Instead of just rejecting that person, ask, you know, if that person is perhaps just different than they are and what seems different to you may be normal to them. Just like Temple uh, talked a moment ago about how she would see paper towels waving to the side of a cow chute and the cattle wouldn't walk through it and she could point that out and the plant managers would say, well, how, how come I didn't see that? Well, the fact is they can't see it and they'll never see it because they don't think like a cow. And, and okay. Temple has the extraordinary ability to think and see like a cow. Um, some of us can think and see as if we are machines. And those are great gifts. Um, it's fine to say, well, everyone should, you know, pay attention and do that. But the fact is, if you don't have that way of perceiving the world, you aren't going to do it. And, and that can cause Temple, me, and other people to act in ways that some people think are strange. But if you're the guy who's got the cattle that won't go up the chute, our ability to see that answer for you is priceless. And, and I think that that's a thing that everyone should keep in mind, that different minds exist for a reason. Mm. And sometimes right. we look different and it's easy to just toss us out without recognizing that you may really need us because there's nobody else who's going to tell you how to get those cows up the chute, if not someone who can see that. Fantastic. Well, they think it's something overly complicated, like tear out the whole facility, when all they needed to do was get rid of the paper towels. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. We, that's great. We should accept everyone for what they are and what their strengths are and, and make and make the best use of uh, everyone's abilities. Uh, love that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Temple and John, for being with us on Brainwaves today. Um, viewers, thank you, too. If you'd like to learn more about John Robeson's thoughts on neurodiversity, you can visit psychologytoday.com or his blog website at jerobeson.blogspot.com. For more information about neurodiversity and autism, visit templegrandin.com. Thanks so much to both of you. Really enjoyed talking to you today and, and loved your insights. Great to be here. Thank you. And now we're so pleased to welcome back two guests who've been on Brainways before. These are two passionate brain health advocates who are, we're very lucky to have back. They, they both have lived experience with schizophrenia themselves, and they are also amazingly talented musicians who perform and in, inspire audiences, ar audiences around the country through the performances of their band, Fog Dog. Now, Carlos Lorari is also a practicing psychiatric nurse practitioner, and Matthew Racher is also a certified peer specialist, an online advocate, and a speaker. And uh, so thank you so much to both of you for coming back to Brainwaves. Thank you so much for having us, Brandon. It's a pleasure to be here. Yep. Great, great. Good to see you again. So I have a few questions for you before you, I'm looking, for, looking forward to hearing your song, but a few questions first, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, how did you come to start Fog Dog and how did you come up with the name? You want to take that one? Well, I'll, I'll take the name part, but you, you tell us, you tell the story about how we met. Um, okay, how we met. So um, basically this was um, seven years after I experienced a crisis uh, hospitalization. Um, my, my mother brought me to a local deli where Carlos was working and introduced us. Um, and, um, and, you know, my mother said, 
you know, Matt, he's got similar lived experience. He's been through some challenges that you've been through. And we started chatting and I thought it was really cool how he was back at work, um, back in school, you know, pursuing his goals at a time when I felt pretty, you know, pretty um, uh, hopeless in a way. Um, seeing somebody with uh, lived experience working and pursuing their, their goals and dreams was inspiring to me. So, um, and then I found out he plays guitar and we started jamming and writing songs and he's a, a lyricist as well. And and then uh, you introduced the name Fog Dog. That's right. I, I used to, uh, well, when well, I would take uh, the Metro to work, I would look at this application that's called, like, it's like a dictionary application. And it gives you a new word a day. And one day it gave me the word Fog Dog. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting word. It kind of sounds like a, like a beer company. Like it sounds like a, <laughs> like a Boston brewery called Fog Dog uh-huh. or something like that. But with the actual definition of the word is the light that breaks through the fog. And once I read the literature on mental health and recovery and psychosis, it often referred to the fog of psychosis or the fog of substance abuse or things like that. So, you know, our, our hope with the with the word with the band name Fog Dog is that with our storytelling and with our music that we could, you know, shed light on the, uh, other people's experiences um, and help uh, break through that fog. That's so inspiring. That's a great name. Tell us about the song you're about to play for us, "A Brighter Day." What was your inspiration for the song? So um, Carlos and I, this was several years back, I think 2017 or so, um, when Hurricane Irma uh, hit South Florida, we were cooped up together and um, doing a lot of songwriting and we thought it would be nice to uh, write a song about this experience, about, you know, kind of going from normal life to this unexpected, um, what, what could be, a, what was a natural disaster for a lot of people and, and this experience. Um, and we want to write a song that was uplifting to kind of let people know beyond what's out of our control, beyond the uh, external circumstances, there is a brighter day, there is light, there is hope, and we can get through this together. So we sat down with a guitar, pen and paper and just started writing and, um, and that's how we came up with the song. Great story. Was that kind of uh, therapeutic or did it help you to kind of manage your anxiety about the crisis you were going through at the time to write the song? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's something about a, a, a catastrophic event or, or this um, kind of gloom and doom in society that uh, causes that creates this need to 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 um, kind of to write and to you know tap into our art and to tap into the music and and spread a message of hope. You know, when there's chaos around us or people uh, you know maybe panic buying before a hurricane or something. So we we definitely think that this song. Um, can relate to times like what we're experiencing now, you know, yeah, or the yeah. current situation around COVID. So, yeah, I can't wait to hear it. Just a moment. Um, what would you say, words of hope to help somebody who might be struggling with mental health challenges or anxiety during this COVID crisis? So, um, I, I would say, uh, for me, what, one thing that I experienced was in in my recovery, this experience of trying to develop a sound relationship with reality, and I, I feel like as you know, psychosis kind of strips you of your reality and uh, exposes you to an altered state of reality. And it, it's very scary. It's an isolating, frightening experience. And I couldn't help but notice during the uh, the pandemic and the uh, societal kind of feelings around it, how it, it does feel like this altered reality, this altered sense of, of our norm kind of shifting to a new to a new norm. So, um, so I, I think it's... Uh, I think that's something that I, I keep in mind as, as I play this song too. And, um, mm-hmm. and as people are, are addressing their mental health during this time, I find it important to, you know, lean on peer support, lean on um, the support of families and professionals, um, keep a, a open and active dialogue about symptoms that, you know, people are experiencing um, in their recovery. And, uh, and I think it's also a great opportunity to develop new wellness tools, you know, while we're, People are quarantined or in isolation. We can focus on journaling and songwriting and cooking and exercise. So it's a good opportunity to hone in on tools that we can take beyond these times as well. So yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, it's an opportunity as much as it is a challenge. Absolutely, a great perspective. What about those having to cope with ongoing mental health challenges who might feel like they just don't fit in at times? Well, Topic. Go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, well, I'd have to say that, you know, the feeling of not feeling like fitting in is, is quite a normal reaction to these experiences. They can be very isolating at first. You know, you can feel like you're the only one going through a mental health episode or crisis. But, you know, first, it's important to know that this is a very, often mental health conditions are very prevalent. They affect one out of four to five people, according to NAMI. 
And I think it's important to, to combat that sense of feeling alone or isolation by finding a community of people, of peers, of, of, of role models, of mentors that get it, that get what your experience is and they value it and they dignify it, whether that is through, and there's a host of, of you know, great nonprofit organizations that provide that sense of community. Uh, you can find that at One Mind, you can find that with NAMI, you can find that with Sarder or Mental Health America or the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance. But the important thing is to, is to find that sense of community. I think these illnesses, um, there's an aspect of them that can be very marginalizing and a, and a facet of recovery is integrating once again into society and, and finding that sense of community is, uh, is critical. Yeah, the people who recognize you for the person you are and the strengths that are in you and, and you can relate to. Exactly, and they, and they value and they, and they dignify that lived experience. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, well, uh, I hope a brighter day is ahead for us, and uh, there's certainly one ahead for us right at the moment uh, with your song. Uh, can you please play your song for us now? Absolutely, of course. We'd be happy to. All right, take it away. Thank you. Okay. And this is, uh, this is our original song called The Brighter Day. Hope you guys enjoy. Thinking about my baby all night long Thinking about my baby as I sing this song Storm surge rising, the wind's blowing fast Worry, my baby, this soon shall pass. Ain't no waters high enough to keep me away. Ain't no wind strong enough to keep my love at bay. Baby, just remember when the rains go away. Baby, just remember there comes, there comes a brighter day. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, guys. Totally, thank you. Absolutely. You totally brightened my day, and I'm sure you did for everybody watching. Uh, oh. If you have an album, I, I totally pick it up in a second. Uh, I want to hear start every day with that song. Thank you. Thank awesome. you so much. Absolutely. Um, you've given me a lot of hope and a lot of good feeling for the, for the day and beyond. Thank you. All right. Well, guys, uh, appreciate you being on Brainwaves again. Hope to have you back in the near future and hope to see you soon. Best wishes and stay, stay healthy and safe. Absolutely. Same to you, Brandon. Thanks for having us again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Brandon. You're welcome. Take care.